Moscow's Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netroomsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. While the E. Jean Carroll trial was adjourned on Monday, Donald Trump spent his time reposting a QAnon account. Here it is right here. Uh, Donald Trump posted an account called AQ Patrons, which spread some of the most despicable uh, QAnon uh, content out there. It's all despicable, but here's what Donald Trump reposted and amplified this account. New Hampshire, let's get Trump to 85% victory with a photoshopped image of JFK, who the Q movement spreads a ton of conspiracies about. By the way, this wasn't the first time that Donald Trump amplified this QAnon account. Previously, back in February of 2023, he reposted and amplified AQ patrons when it said, they told me I could be anything I wanted, so I became the savior of the Western civilization. I mean, just some real sick, malignant, narcissistic stuff right there. And uh, here's another one that Donald Trump previously posted. Uh, Back uh, in December of 2023, uh, Trump wrote a sad day in America and the AQ patrons account that he was amplifying or reposting wrote, they're trying to change our country as fast as they can because they know he's coming back. And uh, there are so many posts by this account, AQ patrons, that are just so disgusting that I don't even want to share it on this YouTube. If you want to do your own digging by going on Trump's social media, I wouldn't even recommend doing that. Why even give him the views? But I mean, some of the most heinous, anti-Semitic, disgusting stuff, and then some just kind of straight up weird stuff like uh, uh, weird conspiracies about uh, Taylor Swift. I mean, just just real, really, really strange stuff. In addition, Donald Trump spent uh, the day um, tormenting his uh, rape victim, E. Jean Carroll. Of course, he was found liable for raping E. Jean Carroll by a jury back in May. And while the federal court adjourned trial because one of the jurors uh, was exposed to COVID and Alina Haba said that she was exposed to COVID uh, and Alina Haba requested the adjournment and over the objections of Roberta Kaplan, E. Jean Carroll's lawyer, Judge Lewis Kaplan, granted the continuance of trial. So trial is going to start on Wednesday. But you can see right here Donald Trump just posting over and over again about E. Jean Carroll. And as I've said before, if you knew anybody who posted like this on any topic, right, whether it was about fantasy football, gardening, movies, whatever, hobby, just posting with this frequency on any topic, it would be bizarre and dangerous and unhinged. And you'd probably say this person needs seriously help. And Donald Trump is doing this to torment uh, his rape victim. Oh, and by the way, Donald Trump gave an interview with Fox, and here uh, Trump is asked by Fox about uh, uh, Nikki Haley talking about Trump's serious cognitive issues and cognitive 
lapses that uh, have been very, very, very prevalent for a long time, but I guess the media is just picking up onto it now. And here was Donald Trump's response in this interview with Fox, demonstrating, again, real serious cognitive issues. Here, play this clip. Um, so Nikki Haley says now she has the two-person race that she's always wanted. She has been coming after you strongly in the past few days. It's worked both ways, um, and you've come after her as well. She she keeps bringing up your age lately. What do you say about that? Well, I think I'm a lot sharper than her. I would do this. I would sit down right now and take an aptitude test, and it would be my result against her result, and she's not going to win. She's not going to even come close to winning. Uh, in fact, when I heard the word cognitive, you know, I've taken two of them now. I took one with Doc Ronnie, who's now a fantastic, you know, White House doctor, and a fantastic uh, congressman from Texas, Admiral, the White House doctor, Jackson, Ronnie Jackson, and he's uh, now a great congressman from Texas. I took uh, one then, and I took one recently. I think the result was announced, and it was, I aced it twice, I aced it. But I would say that, you know, I've actually called for a cognitive test for anybody running for president, because I actually think that's a good idea. It'd be nice to have an intelligent person be president. Uh, but uh, Kelly has too, I believe. So how do you see the race? In that same interview here, Donald Trump uh, says that he should get more credit for how he handled COVID and the job he did on COVID. I mean, play this clip. I think we did a fantastic job on COVID. Uh, nobody knew. You know, I've been given tremendous credit for the economy, for the military, for foreign policy. The one thing I've never been given credit for was the job we did on COVID. We did a fantastic job with all of the uh, all of the medicines. And all, if you look at Regeneron, all of the things that we did, we did a fantastic job, have never been given the credit for that. And basically, I allowed the governors to do their states. And people like Henry McMaster, who was here yesterday, who, by the way, endorsed me, you know, he's the governor of South Carolina. Almost every politician in South Carolina endorsed me, which is a little bit tough for Nikki. But uh, w what aspect of it? Ignoring it, attacking the scientists, telling people to inject bleach into their arms, telling us uh, like a miracle it was all going to go away, saying that we shouldn't have to worry about anything at all. I mean, w w what aspect do you think you deserve uh, credit for? Oh, here, Donald Trump just demonstrating that he's just total, just brain mush coming out at this point. I guess he's trying to attack President Biden for lower gas prices, but then starts talking about our country being destroyed. The sentence is not coherent. Here, play this clip. And, you know, gasoline was under $2. Now it's uh, very high, coming down because they're doing, they're throwing everything they possibly can to get at it. But right after the election, if that ever happened, and you just better hope to God it doesn't happen where he gets in because he's destroying this country. So would you and again, Trump has asked another very straightforward question by uh, this Fox host in this interview about would you do larger corporate tax cuts? And Trump can't actually say a sentence like he's incapable of that. Here, play this clip. Uh, would you do larger cuts, corporate yeah, cuts? Yeah, I was planning on doing it. In fact, uh, had the result been different, the result was just fine, by the way. Uh, you'll probably cut that out, but that's okay. But uh, we've got more votes. In and also in terms of what's going on today at the same time that Donald Trump is tormenting his rape victim at the same time Donald Trump is demonstrating some serious cognitive lapses that you're observing right there. Well, um, the Dow has never been higher, setting records every single day. This as other metrics are uh, in the right direction as well, whether it is uh, unemployment being down, job creation up, GDP growth at record levels. Here, let's just play this clip from Fox, though, where even Neil Cavuto had to admit what was going on. Play this clip. Watching something that you might have noticed in the corner of your screen here, the Dow has never been higher than this, 38,000. It eclipsed that level in the closing minutes of the trading day. That is a new record. Uh, S&P 500 also hitting a record. Technology stocks, remember those magnificent seven technology stocks? Even more magnificent right now. The wind at their proverbial back is an improvement on the interest rate front and the notion that we have again found this sweet spot where the Federal Reserve will still cut interest rates. The devil is in the details on exactly when, but the growing betting is an election year where the Dow and the major markets typically run up seven to eight percent. That is on top of what you're seeing now, that it will continue. Meanwhile, how that's right, the Dow broke 38,000 for the first time in history. 
And of course, when Donald Trump was in office, we were told that the stock market was the main metric for economic success, even though of course it isn't. Now when the other important metrics for economic success are up and the stock market's up, we're told none of that matters. Just listen to whatever Donald Trump uh, has to say. And so we listen to him. We go, okay, well, what is he saying? Here was Donald Trump at his speech in New Hampshire um, comparing himself to a pedo priest and saying that like a pedo priest, Trump says he should get absolute immunity as well, like the pedo priest, which they don't get absolute immunity. And what the heck is he talking about here? Play this clip. But it's a little bit like the police. So you have a rogue cop. You know what a rogue cop is? Very seldom, but you have bad people. You have people, no matter where, no matter what. In the church, you have some people that aren't so good, right? But you have people, a rogue cop or a bad apple, whatever. And what they do is they make it so that you catch, so that it can't happen. And therefore, everyone else is allowed to commit crimes, murders, like at levels that we've never seen before. No, we're going to have to do this immunity for the president. If you have a president that doesn't have immunity, he's never going to be free to do anything because the opposing party will always indict him as soon as he leaves the White House. And you can't let that happen. You can't. You take away all of the power of the presidency, it'll be a different country. So hope. By the way, other metrics are up as well. Both oil and natural gas production in the United States are at all time highs despite the fact that you have MAGA Republicans like Marsha Blackburn say, Joe Biden has destroyed U.S. energy independence. Gas prices remain sky high and our dependence on foreign countries for oil only strengthens our adversaries. Gas production, oil production is at an all-time high and gas prices are down. Fortunately, there was a reader's, uh, there was a, a note on Blackburn's tweet, a reader's note. U.S. is producing crude oil at or near all-time high rates. Meanwhile, gas prices remain relatively low compared to recent years. I'll give you another example where these MAGA Republicans just say whatever it is just to kind of totally, uh, just to totally lie. Like you'll have Mike Lee says a comment like this, uh, under President Biden, the federal government won't protect our borders and states are prohibited from doing so disgraceful. But if you actually look at what the, the data is, and by the way, you may not like the policies that lead to this data, but this is just so we're all clear what the objective data is, is that the Biden administration has physically removed more migrants from the U.S than any administration in history. There were almost 2.5 million Title 42 expulsions under Biden, 35 times as many expulsions as people put into the remain in Mexico under Trump policy. And as Ron Filipkowski, our editor in chief said, I think the central problem is that the Biden administration will either not talk about it or are afraid to kind of talk about that out of fear of alienating part of its base. but. You know, the, the, those are the facts right there. Oh, and by the way, just so you see that Donald Trump has a history of posting all of this kind of QAnon stuff. This is, I think he's posted about 500 or 600 QAnon posts in the past 18 months to two years. This is a, a post from Fruit Snacks that Donald Trump likes to amplify. If you go and you zoom in on Donald Trump, you'll see the the uh, the, the Q Plus logo uh, right there. That's the type of stuff that Donald Trump is reposting. By the way, take what Donald Trump was saying, take all those posts and let's compare it to Vice President Kamala Harris. And she's been uh, uh, going out and giving a lot more speeches lately, especially on the issue of women's reproductive rights. So here, let me play this clip right here of Vice President Kamala Harris. Play this clip. And while these extremists say they are motivated by the health and well-being of women and children, in reality, they ignore the crisis of maternal mortality. The top 10 states with the highest rates of maternal mortality all have abortion bans. The hypocrisy abounds. And let us be clear about what they're up to. These extremists want to roll back the clock to a time before women were treated as full citizens. Wisconsin to the 1800s. Just look at what happened here in this beautiful state of Wisconsin. 
After Roe was dismantled, extremists evoked a law from 1849 to stop abortion in this state. 1849, before women could vote, before women could hold elected office, before many women could even own property in a state whose motto is forward. These extremists are trying to take us backward. Well, we're not having that. We're not having that. Here's another clip of Vice President Harrison's play. And so as we face this crisis, as we are clear-eyed about the harm, let us also understand who is responsible. Shall we? The former president handpicked three Supreme Court justices because he intended for them to overturn Roe. He intended for them to take your freedoms. And it is a decision he brags about. A couple weeks ago, he said that for years, quote, they were trying to get Roe v. Wade terminated, but he said, quote, I did it and I'm proud to have done it. Proud, proud, proud that women across our nation are suffering? Proud that women have been robbed of a fundamental freedom? Proud that doctors could be thrown in prison for caring for their patients? That young women today have fewer rights than their mothers? How dare he? So take that and I'll just leave you with this because we'll compare Vice President Kamala Harris with who many people are saying is would be Trump's VP pick, Elise Stefanik. And by the way, Donald Trump doesn't even know how to say her name, just to be clear. So what Donald Trump tried to pronounce her name the other night. It's pretty easy to say. Play it. Do you see that, the three people? How good did Elise Stefanik do? Anyway, this is what Elise Stefanik had to say um, when she was asked about Donald Trump's major cognitive issues and saying that Nikki Haley was involved in the January 6th insurrection, that he offered troops to Nikki Haley. Um, You have Elise Stefanik say that's what he meant to say. He was comparing comparing Nikki Haley to Nancy Pelosi. Here, play this clip. That isn't a mix-up. Uh, the reality is Nikki Haley, she wasn't speaker. Nikki Haley is relying on Democrats, just like Nancy Pelosi, uh, to try to have a desperate showing in New York, in New Hampshire. Wait, but he was so talking President about January Trump, 6th. President Trump has not lost a step. He is a stronger candidate, stronger than he is today, than he was in 2016, and he was in 2020. Compare that to Joe Biden's weakness. I can't oh tell you how disappointing God. I feel. How disappointed I feel every time I see her talk. She's a clown. Republican. I mean, it doesn't get much more pathetic than that. I don't know. Or maybe it does. You have the Republican Party in Florida uh, run by the Republican CFO, Jimmy Patronus. This is in Florida right now, folks. Announcing that they are going to be trying to introduce a bill to use $5 million in taxpayer dollars to help Donald Trump with his legal bills. They had to help a billionaire who's already grifted 60 or $70 million in legal fees from his political action committee. Florida's chief financial officer, Jimmy Petronas, you see him right there, wants to take $5 million from taxpayer money to help Donald Trump in his cases. I, I, I don't even know what to tell you about this modern-day Republican Party. They're not, they're not Republicans anymore. They're, it's MAGA. It's Trumpism. It's very weird. But uh, you'll see it for yourself right there. It is Tuesday, 
the 23rd of January of 2024. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. Precious, the little Yorkie, is our door girl. And she will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. A small scant dash, a mere pinch of hot smoked Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. You know it has. Always. It always has. And it always will. Okay, got the tagline out of the way. We had a, well, a much longer opening clip than we normally have, but I just thought that these uh, Medias guys, Medias, I think I just think that they're uh, rather rather thorough in their uh, deconstruction of what the hell is going on. And uh, I thought it important, but also real life sometimes intrudes, even though the show must go on. So, as you know, I care for my elderly mom and, you know, and the dogs, too. You know, mom's pretty good. You know, she'll she'll hold off, even though that might be detrimental. And I tell her, you know, come on. But the dogs, they don't care. Yeah. Even though one's snoozing. And the other one's the door girl. They sometimes make demands. Yes. Collectively, by the way. Whew. Alrighty. Well, we love them anyway. So, how are you? Uh, looks like uh, New Hampshire. <laughs> Nikki Haley uh, won all six votes in uh, Dixville Notch. And uh, so... I I asked uh, uh, David at the top of his show, well, I, I, I'm pretty sure. Does that mean that uh, we get six more weeks of winter? And uh, so, yeah. I don't know. I think it does. And that's what's going to happen. Now, either that or we could get like the Fifth Reich. Because the fourth one just went blowing right on through it. Now we're on to the fifth, apparently. So not that Nikki Haley's going to be, uh, you know, at the top of that ticket, because we know who's that about. Who is that about? Yeah, the guy with the cognitive decline, rapidly declining. Do we, is it important to, I don't know, joke about that? I, I don't know if it's important. Those of us who are caring for parents who have some dementia going on. Uh, I think that, at least for me, um, my mom could run this country way better than that syphilitic uh, traitor. Seditious bastard, he. <laughs> Something's going on there. And uh, I know that the way these guys think, that if it happens to them or they do something, everybody is doing it and everybody is doing it worse than they are. That's the common MO for that kind of mindset and behavior of a certain subset of the human race. And uh, so, of course, they're going to say that Joe is doddering. <laughs> and old Mike Flynn... And his crew have been working pretty damn hard to convince people that they're seeing things that are not there. I really feel that this push to get humanities out of the schools, you know, humanities just by the mere, I don't know, immersion in it, teaches you critical thinking and they don't even teach you, like, they don't even have like a critical thinking course. I know they do. It's called logic and semantics, but um, still, nonetheless, and that's a hard, that's a pretty damn hard course. I got to tell you, logic and semantics, it's not, oh, yeah, we'll just uh, go through there and fall asleep and get a grade. Good one, too. No, it's a lot more involved than that. But regardless, just by immersing oneself in the vastness of the humanities, 
pretty much convinces us that uh, when you go out in the world, you can't, no, no one can just do their own research. Oh, I did my own research. No wonder they want to get rid of the humanities because they want a bunch of people out there who can do their own research, get brainwashed by the likes of a Mike Flynn or even hostile foreign actors rather than domestic. And you know the Flynn's in cahoots with you-know-who. There's a reason why Obama got rid of that traitor, and there's a reason why this guy's doing what he's doing because a black guy did it to him. That's what exacerbated it. All of this... Even when they talk about, oh, well, Obama's running the show from the background. That's because Trump is running the show on his side from the background. So it must be Obama or some nefarious creature. And it could be Obama because he's a secret Muslim. Let us not forget this birther BS was pushed the hardest by Donald Trump to the point where he almost originated it. But he doesn't originate anything. He steals it. Somebody, uh, maybe it was Gateway Pundit, I can't even remember, but uh, they just mentioned, oh, you know, in joking. What if he's a secret Muslim? And then the birther thing started coming around. Black guys always have to prove their credentials. That's what's going on with this uh, assistant DA or special prosecutor working uh, for Fannie Willis down there in, is it Fannie? I like to say Fannie because we're Americans. Anyway. Ms. Willis, down there in Georgia, they released that divorce, uh, sealed divorce uh, uh, papers thing. And uh, pretty much it's like all divorces, you know, squabbling about property and money, that kind of stuff. It was already a foregone conclusion that his wife had had an affair with his best friend in their bed. That kind of pisses people off. I'm serious. That 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 would piss a wife off if he did it with, you know, his his uh, squeeze side squeeze. She bopped his best friend in their bed and they got divorced. And then this guy, Mike Roman, who is a rat fucker. And I'm sorry I'm saying the F word that early in the morning, but rat fucker is the self-designated uh de bloom those guys dirty tricksters was the media cleaning up the rat fucker part because roger stone at all coined it and this guy is a rat fucker worked for coke industries we know all this i just wish that media would bring that up that this guy is well healed in the uh, art of rat fucking so you got Alina Haba, who's got, I don't know, she's, you know, they, they showed a picture of her at Mar-a-Lago, uh, scantily clad, and it, I know it's supposed to be, like, swim attire, but it looked like, uh, you know, a bra and, you know, some sort of weird ripped lace type thing wrapped around her as a, I don't know, semi-dress. You know, poolside wear. So, you know, there's a reason why you haven't seen Melania around lately, and it's not because her mom was dying. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Melania's got her uh, bodyguard that she's, you know, has been rumored to be having some sort of, I don't know, tete-a-tete, head-to-head. I don't know. Is that what it is? Maybe I shouldn't say that so early in the morning. But regardless, this guy Mike Roman, back to that guy, rat fucker par excellence and the media won't ever mention it it's starting to bother me we like to joke it's 2016 all over again well, yeah there's, you know, there's elements of it people are falling into line i remember when hillary clinton had a cough and all the media went head over heels. They had to get specialists on TV. Is she going to die? We can't have her running. Or she's going to die. There was a death watch for her. So I don't know. Maybe maybe people are finally uh, catching on to, you know, this decline that Trump is exhibiting daily. And yet, here's Joe Biden. 
riding a bicycle, you know, writing love letters to his wife. They're holding hands, taking a walk on the beach, uh, solving or trying to solve the Middle East crisis and dealing with Bibi Netanyahu and his idiocy. And then, you know, the psyops bullshit from the Hamas uh, crowd and, you know, Vladimir Putin doing his bullshit. And he's like fending off all of this and doing it really well. And the stock market is booming and they're saying that that's a bad thing. Mm hmm. Sort of like 2016 again, sort of. All right, what do we have in store for you since we better get it on, get it on. <laughs> and uh, because uh, the cognitive lapses and unhinged behavior is accelerating at a rapid pace for that old Donald Trump. And I hope it's not for me, too. Eek. Nope, because on the rest of the menu, the trial of a $12 million federal racial discrimination lawsuit has begun between a local Hispanic business in the city of Klamath Falls, Oregon. Magaland, Oath Keeper, Constitutional Sheriff Land. Okay. The U.S. Supreme Court won't overrule a federal judge's order to redraw the Detroit legislative seats, and that's a win for the Dems, actually. And the Department of Transportation awarded over $1 billion in federal funding to replace the aging John A. Blatnick Bridge between Minnesota and Wisconsin. After the break, we move to the chef's table where the EU, the European Union, sanctioned six, six companies accused of trying to undermine stability in conflict Horn Sudan and Cameroon will be the first country to routinely give children a new malaria vaccine as the shots are rolled out in Africa. Can't do it here because apparently parents who know better than the rest of us want malaria to spread. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Into the show, we're going to forego the usuals. We'll pick it up tomorrow, maybe. And we're going to tuck into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And it comes from the NBC affiliate here in Southern Oregon, Kobe 5. And uh, Taylor Anschers is the correspondent penning the piece. A $12 million federal trial began yesterday, Monday, in Medford. A business owner says they were targeted and discriminated against by the city of Klamath Falls back in 2019. Member MAGA. The current and previous owners of El Palacio, a restaurant and lounge in a prominent landmark building in downtown Klamath Falls, say they were discriminated against and targeted to a higher level of law enforcement activity because of their race. Many of the claims come under former Klamath Falls Police Chief and now current County Commissioner David Hensley. The family says Hensley told them the property was a public nuisance and revoked their liquor license despite the family's attempts to increase security on the property at his request. The family's attorney, Christopher Cobble, previously told NBC5 the former police chief's actions were a violation of the family's rights, attributing everything to El Palacio, even though issues with fighting and intoxication and things like that are shared amongst everybody in that area, all the other bars, uh, but simply focusing on El Palacio. El 
Palacio clearly shows that they are being treated differently because of their race, Coble said. It is a violation of federal law. It's a violation of the U.S. Constitution to do that. And court documents say the trial is expected to last a week. Joey Capaletti of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. The U.S. Supreme Court yesterday, Monday, rejected a request from Michigan's redistricting commission to overrule an order to redraw 13 Detroit area seats in the legislature, a decision that will likely make the legislative maps more competitive. The redistricting commission had asked the high court to overrule a December ruling by a three-judge federal appeals court panel that Michigan's legislative maps were illegally influenced by race when drawn in 2021. The panel ruled that although nearly 80% of Detroit residents are black, the black voting age population in the 13 Detroit area districts mostly ranged from 35 to 45 percent, with one being as low as 19 percent. The panel ordered that the seven state House districts have their boundaries redrawn for the 2024 election and set it and it set a later deadline for the six state Senate districts because those senators terms don't expire until 2026. A drafted House map is due by February 2nd, and a final deadline is for March 29th. The Supreme Court did not explain its decision in the order released yesterday, Monday. Attorneys for the commission did not immediately respond to emails seeking comment. John Bursch, an attorney for the Detroit voters who sued the commission, said they were very pleased by the order. Bursch said the commission could still appeal, but he called the Supreme Court's order a strong indicator that such an appeal will likely fail. Although it's unknown how the new maps will be drawn, there would likely be an increased number in the number of Detroit-focused districts. That's a nice way of putting it. That would be solidly Democratic, said David Dulio, a political science professor at Oakland University in Michigan. That would likely affect districts in the suburbs, which would become more competitive as a result. Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Officials announced yesterday, Monday, in a statement that the U.S. Department of Transportation has awarded nearly $1.06 billion in federal funding to replace the aging John A. Blatnick Bridge between Duluth, Minnesota and Superior, Wisconsin. The bridge is an important freight and commercial connection between the, the Duluth 
uh, superior twin ports and serves more than 33,000 vehicles per day. It is jointly owned and managed by the Minnesota Department of Transportation and the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. For more than 60 years, the bridge has linked Duluth and Superior via Interstate 535 and US 53. It is also one of the largest marine links for U.S. trade with Canada, the top trade partner of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and the United States. The bridge replacement project will improve safety and accommodate oversized and overweight loads. The total cost for rebuilding the bridge is estimated to be $1.8 billion, according to the statement, and each state committed $400 million towards the project last year. Design work for the project, which will determine specifications and the shape, and the shape the final project is expected to begin this year. Once a final design is selected, construction could begin as early as next year. Well, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, humor will set you free. Much like its protagonist, American fiction doesn't fit neatly into any one box. Part dramedy, part satire, and part character study, the film tells the tale of Thelonious Monk Ellison, a writer and academic from an upper-middle-class background who declares he doesn't see race despite the fact that everyone else around him does. Monk, played by Jeffrey Wright, pens highbrow, well-reviewed novels that don't sell. Fed up with having his work grouped alongside bestsellers he views as exploitative and embodying the worst stereotypes of black culture, Monk decides to pen a novel in a similar vein just for fun. However, to his surprise, and that of his literary agent, the parody book not only becomes a bestseller, but also a critic's choice for its supposed rawness and authenticity. As a result, Monk has to juggle not only a new persona as a debut author with the ridiculous nom de pen, Stag R. Lee, but he also has to evaluate who he really is and weigh his wanting to create so-called respectable art against his desire to make money from his craft. Add to this a subplot involving his tense relationships with his extensive family, and American fiction could have easily crossed into melodrama. Luckily, screenwriter and debut director Ford Jefferson doesn't allow this. He handles everything with a deft hand, and as a result, the talents of Wright, Tracy Ellis Ross, Issa Rae, and Sterling K. Brown shine through with Jefferson's sharp as a tax script. Indeed, the writing is so good that even the exacting critical monk would probably love it. American fiction is easily one of the best films of the past year or so. Here's hoping it's not totally overlooked for awards. This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This is the story of a very special woman. In a matter of seconds, she turned herself into a great mathematician or an entrepreneur. Her knowledge was limitless and still is. She could also make monsters disappear, especially those that lurked in the shadows under the bed. Once, this woman put back together a teenage girl's broken heart, which had been shattered in a thousand pieces just by giving her a bear hug. She masqueraded as a regular person at work, but as a superhero at home. Everyone knows her as Gabriella. I still call her mom. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need to help, complete with tips and resources, at aarp.org caregiving. 
a public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? It's all we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. A real-life get-out-of-jail-free card? Seriously? I'm Baratunde Thurston from The Onion, and also... Sh- <laughs> mother... <laughs> You're listening to the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. In New York, the card, although it's called that, doesn't actually get you out of jail. But it does get you out of tickets for speeding and other moving violations. According to a recent New York Times expose, quote, The police unions distribute the wallet-sized courtesy card to members, who in turn pass them out to friends and family members. The card has in large font on the front the name of the union, and the name of the officer who distributed the card is generally written on the back. So, motorists who are pulled over hand the card to a cop with the unwritten understanding that the cop will ignore the infraction and let the driver go. The ostensible justification for these cards The police say they are symbols of the bonds between the police and their extended family and friends. But the article highlights a cop who didn't follow the unwritten rule and professionally has paid the price and now is suing. The take home here, we have another example of rules that theoretically apply to everyone, but just don't apply to everyone equally. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU. Because freedom can't protect itself. You're listening to the American Democracy Minute, keeping your government buy-in for the people. We're in the Carolinas today, where South Carolina's election director appealed for higher pay to replace poll workers driven off by threats and low wages. And North Carolina democracy groups want clarity of new restrictive voter ID rules. State's Newsroom reports that the director of the South Carolina Election Commission asked for $4 million from a South Carolina House Budget Committee to raise stipends for county poll workers and help retain state staff. Director Howard Knapp said turnover was the highest that he'd seen in his 12 years of state government and blamed it on a combination of low pay and sustained personal threats. Knapp also asked for an additional $11.5 million to cover an expected doubling of election costs due to expected higher turnout and the addition of early voting. In North Carolina, democracy groups asked the state election board to clarify rules for the state's new voter ID law. Three counties were cited by the groups as having violated state guidance in 2023 and subjectively rejecting voters based on their reason for lack of ID. North Carolina Newsline reports that voters were given an opportunity to fill out an exception form and provisional ballot, but that county officials in Guilford, Mecklenburg, and Brunswick counties second-guessed some voters' exception reasons, including that of a wheelchair-bound voter with Huntington's disease. We have links to more details at AmericanDemocracyMinute.org. I'm Brian Beal. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1933. That was the day 6,000 workers at Briggs Manufacturing in Detroit walked off the job and sparked a strike wave of 15,000 auto body workers. Briggs made auto bodies for Ford, Chrysler, and Hudson in four Detroit area plants. Their pay and working conditions were considered among the worst in the nation, inspiring the adage, if poison doesn't work, try Briggs. Earlier in the month, workers at the Waterloo plant, under the leadership of the short-lived Automobile Workers Union, struck against company-wide wage cuts and won. 
Their victory encouraged workers at the Highland Park and Mack Avenue Briggs plants to walk out over additional demands, which they joined in solidarity. Workers demanded the recognition of shop committees and pushed back against starvation wages. They also protested the hated dead time policy, which required workers to stay on the job, unpaid, waiting for material or production lines. They wanted an end to pay deductions for tools and a worthless health insurance policy that left some with bi-weekly pay as low as 49 cents. Briggs quickly conceded to a wage increase and the end of dead time, but they would not budge on recognizing the union. As the strike dragged on, strike breakers under police escort increased, as did the red baiting of union organizers. Workers gained nothing more and ended their walkout in early May. According to historian Joyce Shaw Peterson, the walkout had been the most significant auto strike up until that point. Worker militancy and public support were impressive. As one worker recalled, after the Ford Hunger March the year before, workers took to the picket lines, facing down fears of physical injury or even death to fight for a better life. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin weather from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 47 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs in the mid to upper 50s. Looks like we'll uh, be mostly cloudy and maybe not much rain, if at all, during the daylight hours. Winds will be light and variable. But cloudy skies with periods of rain in the early to late evening with uh, uh, turning to showers later on, near, uh, lows near the mid-40s. Winds will be light and variable, and we are looking at a quarter inch of rain overnight. And then cloudy with showers in the morning tomorrow. Highs in the low 50s. Winds light and variable, and we're expecting another quarter inch of rain tomorrow. Pollen remains rated none here in the town of Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 15 parts per million. And the daytime UV index is low at level 1. Barometric pressure is rising at 30 inches. Visibility is at 5 miles. And relative humidity is at 99%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. And that is the Weather Underground. London is 55 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 52 degrees and cloudy. Rome is 58 and sunny. Bagram is 35 and clear. Kiev is, is 31 degrees with snow showers. Hong Kong is 43 and partly cloudy with lots of wind. Looks like Tokyo is 45 degrees and clear. Melbourne, Victoria, Australia is 80 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 54 degrees and partly cloudy with a coastal flood watch, so take care. Chicago, Illinois is 35 degrees with a rain shower and they are under a winter storm watch. And New York, New York is 38 degrees Fahrenheit with rain showers. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Oh, 
The World Desk of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. The European Union imposed sanctions yesterday, Monday, on six companies it said are responsible for trying to undermine stability and conflict-ravaged Sudan, largely targeting firms linked to weapons procurement and manufacturing. Sudan plunged into chaos last April when long-simmering tensions between the military, led by General Abdel Fattah Burnham, and the Rapid Support Forces paramilitary, commanded by Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, Dagalo, erupted into street battles in the capital, Khartoum, and other areas, including the western Darfur region. The fighting has displaced 7 million people and killed 12,000, according to the United Nations. Local doctors, groups, and activists say the true death toll is far higher. Given the gravity of the situation in Sudan, the EU statement said, sanctions were imposed on two companies making weapons and vehicles for Sudan's armed forces, the Zadna International Company for Investment, controlled by the armed forces, and three companies involved in procuring military equipment for the RSF. Five of the companies are Sudanese. One is registered in the United Arab Emirates. The company's assets will be frozen in the EU, and EU citizens are banned from making funds or economic resources available to them. The U.S. in recent months has imposed sanctions on senior Sudanese military leaders and companies, Regional partners have been trying to mediate an end to the conflict along the, along with Saudi Arabia and the U.S., which facilitated unsuccessful indirect talks between the warring parties as recently as November. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mes automnes, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Even more staff at the World Desk of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Cameroon will be the first country to re- routinely give children a new malaria vaccine as the shots are rolled out in Africa. The campaign was described by officials as a milestone in the decades-long effort to curb the mosquito spread disease on the continent, which accounts for 95% of the world's, world's malaria deaths. The Central, Central Africa nation hopes to vaccinate about 250,000 children this year and next year. Uh, 20 other African countries are going to help them get the vaccine and that those countries will hopefully immunize more than 6 million children through 2025. In Africa, there are, are about 250 million cases of the parasitic disease each year, including 600,000 deaths mostly in young children. Cameroon will be the first of two recently approved malaria vaccines known as Mosquirix. The World Health Organization endorsed the vaccine two years ago, acknowledging that even though it is imperfect, its use would still dramatically reduce severe infections and hospitalizations. The GlaxoSmithKline produced shot is only about 30% effective, requires four doses, and protection begins to fade after several months. The vaccine was tested in Africa and used in pilot programs in three countries. GlaxoSmithKline has said it will only produce about 15 
million doses of the vaccine a year, and some experts believe a second malaria vaccine developed by Oxford University and approved by the World Health World Health Organization in October might be a more practical solution. That vaccine is cheaper, requires three doses, and India's Serum Institute said they could make up to 200 million doses a year. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver